Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Andrew Nudigat. I am an engineer at GitLab, where I focus on availability, reliability, uh, automation, and observability of our SaaS platform, um, specifically gitlab.com and uh, GitLab Dedicated, which is a new product that we're building. And I, I come from uh, Cape Town in South Africa, and this is a picture of, of where I live. Um, it was 30 degrees, so I was really worried about um, freezing here, but it's not been too bad, actually. Um, to start as a way of introduction, uh, let's briefly take a look at a very high-level overview of the GitLab application architecture. So starting on the left, we have um, several front-end services that handle incoming requests. And for the most part, these are written in Go. And then in the center of the application, we have this monolithic Rails application, which the majority of our product engineers spend most of their time working on. Um, and this runs as a Ruby on Rails web application, and it also has uh, background processing taking place through Sidekick. Um, behind the application, we run Git, uh, or Gitly, which is our Git RPC service. And this runs on a large number of VMs uh, with block storage attached to them. We have six Redis clusters in our production fleet, but the number is, is always increasing. Um, and the reason we always need to add more Redis clusters is because for any given cluster, um, a single core on the primary instance of that cluster is a resource bottleneck. Um, and this is because of much of the way, or much of the Redis workload runs on a single thread. And this makes uh, scaling these clusters uh, uh, tricky. And so when we reach capacity on the primary, we'll very often split the Redis into, into two clusters, each with a subset of the traffic. And then finally, at the bottom of the, of the image, we have um, our Postgres cluster. Well, we actually have two clusters. We have the main cluster and a CI cluster. And the work to decompose CI out of the main cluster successfully uh, was completed in July of this year. And before that, all the SQL traffic was handled only by the main cluster. And we're going to talk about that a little bit in this talk. So let's define a few terms that we're going to use through, through this talk. Um, the first term that I'm going to define is, is a resource. So a resource is any component within a computer system that has limited availability. And so very often, people tend to focus on physical resources, such as CPU or memory or bandwidth. And these are, of course, very important examples of resources. But at every level of abstraction within a system, there are resources that have finite capacity and that we need to monitor and track. Uh, for example, at the operating system level, uh, a process has a limited number of file descriptors that it can open at any one time. And Kubernetes applies many more limits. Uh, for example, uh, disk space within a, a persistent volume claim is one example, and of course, memory and CPU limits. Um, an example at a, uh, of, a, of a resource at a network level, at least within a cloud provider, is NAT host ports. And when this hits capacity, you might find that your application experiences some connectivity issues. So databases add many more resources, uh, database connection pools in the application and within connection pooling infrastructure are just one example of that. And then in languages like Python and Ruby, uh, much of the application is run on a single thread behind a global interpreter lock. And this thread can be uh, viewed as a type of resource as well with the upper limit of a single core. Uh, finally, within our applica your application may have sort of custom concurrency limits too to protect itself from traffic spikes, and these can be treated as resources. So at present, we monitor about 41 different resource types on GitLab.com, and I've included a link to the definitions of those resource types at the bottom of the slide. So the next definition is utilization. So utilization should be fairly evident. It's a measure of how much a given resource uh, is being consumed at any moment in time. Uh, utilization always has a unit of measure. For example, we might be measuring it in open files, or bytes, or database connections. And then capacity is, for any given resource, the maximum utilization possible. For example, the maximum number of uh, files that a, that a process can open at any one time, the total capacity of a disk in bytes, or the maximum number of database connections allowed in a pool. So uh, utilization percentage is the utilization expressed as a percentage of the capacity of a resource. All of our utilization metrics are expressed in this way as a percentage. Uh, we do this because it's easier to deal with these metrics in a normalized form, with 0% being unutilized and 100% being at capacity. So the final definition is saturation. 
And saturation is the name we give to a condition uh, when the utilization of a resource hits a threshold value over which the, use, uh, over which the resource is no longer able to um, meet the demands that are placed on it. And this normally happens near or at capacity, but not in all cases. So in most cases, saturation, or at least prolonged saturation, will adversely impact the performance of your system. And this might have effects ranging from in increased queuing and higher latencies through to elevated error rates, or in some cases, you might experience complete system failure. So let's talk about the problem that we're trying to solve by doing capacity planning. And this might be best illustrated with, uh, with the story. Uh, so going back to the architecture diagram I showed earlier, um, I mentioned that we'd recently split our Postgres database into two different clusters. Um, and this took a team of engineers many months of careful uh, planning and execution to carry out. And since our main Postgres cluster is running uh, on the largest instances available to us, we could no longer scale the system vertically any further. And therefore, the only option that was available to us was to cleave this apart and break it into two separate clusters. Um, at, the, at the inception of the project, we needed to know, uh, with a reasonable de degree of accuracy, um, how, long it would take for, how, how long we could continue to use the existing architecture before hitting resource saturation in our Postgres cluster. If we overestimated the date, the project uh, might be shelved for other projects deemed more urgent, only for us to realize too late that we were likely to hit saturation. And if we underestimated the date, we might rush the migration and cutting corners at the expense of availability or reliability and introducing further risk into the system. So neither of these is ideal. And the point is that uh, some saturation issues have very long lead times that, need, that we need to address in order to resolve or mitigate them. And some saturation can be resolved within minutes. For example, if you're running on Kubernetes and you get a, a traffic spike, then the horizontal pod autoscaler will automatically correct the situation within minutes and without any human interaction. This is not the type of situation we're concerned about with our capacity planning. But there are other types of resources that have mitigation spanning from weeks to months, and these are what our capacity planning effort is focused on. So let's take a look at some different types of saturation and their mitigation times. Uh, in some cases, the low impact of saturation or the ease of mitigation means that we don't need to focus on these resources as a priority in our capacity planning process. However, there are many other resources that, once they've hit saturation, have mitigation times stretching from days to weeks or even months. Uh, if one of these resources unexpectedly becomes saturated, uh, it could have a detrimental impact on the availability for an extended period. This could mean that requests to the service start experiencing latency issues, or the application could just fail completely. For example, in the case of a transaction or a Postgres transaction ID wraparound event, reaching saturation will automatically shut the database down, and a disaster recovery operation will need to take place. The goal of our capacity planning process is to focus on resources with high risk or long mitigation times, and to ensure that we're keeping track of utilization and growth on those resources so we can plan ahead. So this is really the goal. It's to build an objective, data-driven approach to estimating capacity. And we want to start, uh, we also want it to be automated so that we can scale it to cover all, all the resources within our system um, together. And we do this uh, by breaking each service down into its constituent res resources and then forecasting growth on those, on those uh, resources individually. And then we can build a roadmap of engineering efforts, prioritized according to urgency, severity, and mitigation time. And this is really how we work with our capacity planning process. So the, this goal relies on, on us having a way to predict growth across different types of resources. And the next challenge is having a reliable prediction or forecast. In some resources, this is very easy to perform, but this isn't always the case. So let's take a look. So, um, these are the two main types of, of resource growth that we see in the system. On the left, that's linear growth, uh, and on the right, that's what we call seasonal growth. And so linear growth, as the name suggests, is linear. Uh, and you can see, uh, you often very much see this in, in storage subsystems, so like disks and disk utilization. Linear growth is very easy to predict. Prometheus has a built-in function called predict linear, and it can perform linear prediction uh, within a PromQL expression 
And you're probably already actually using this to monitor disk utilization and if you're going to run out of disk capacity in the next few hours. So the second type of growth, as I mentioned, is seasonal growth. And this, this growth is generally usage driven. So as users hit the application concurrently, we see higher resource utilization. And then after hours, we see the utilization diminish as the users leave the site. With seasonal growth, usage follows multiple, uh, multiple patterns that are compounded together in a sort of Fourier series. For GitLab.com, we see strong seasonality over hours in the day. And we also see strong seasonality in days in the week. And there's also patterns that we see over the year and also on certain days and or certain public holidays. For example, we know that on the 1st of January every year, we're going to see low utilization because people aren't, aren't committing to, to GitLab. <laughs> and, well, most people aren't. Underneath all of this, we also have a long-term trend. And so, for example, you can see on this chart on the right, it's sort of growing week on week, and that's, that's the long-term trend. And so in order to build a proper forecast, we need to consider all of these trends and patterns together. So our early efforts focused on just focused on the long-term trend, the, the flat line. Um, but this didn't take into account the multiple seasonal cycles uh, within the data. So we tried to build forecasting using PromQL functions, using uh, predict linear. But this didn't turn out to be very accurate at all. The problem was that for each different resource, we needed to tune the forecast to the data at hand. And this just wasn't scalable, because we have so many different resources that we're trying to do this on. So given the number of, of, of resources, this simply isn't scalable. And in, in hindsight, I, it's clear that it wouldn't work, because what we really needed was a better, smarter, more adaptive model for forecasting that could work with the seasonalities that we see in our data. So luckily, around this time, we heard about an open source project out of Meta, or I think they were still called Facebook at the time. And the project's called Profit. It's a library uh, written in both R and Python for performing forecasting and predictions. It seemed like a much better fit for, the pur for our purposes than linear regression could ever be. So we started experimenting with a proof of concept. Uh, luckily, it became uh, clear very quickly that it was well matched to the task at hand. So here are some of the reasons why we really liked uh, Profit and why it worked for us. So firstly, data forecasting is notoriously difficult to do, and it generally requires specialist data science skills. However, Profit has been designed uh, explicitly to make forecasting easier and without the need for those specialist skills. So Profit works on time series data, and it can make very good forecasts without needing specific tuning or customization on a per series basis. It's also very fast. Um, and then it's also able to recognize the seasonal patterns, for example, daily, weekly, and monthly forecasts, or seasonality. And since our utilization data is strongly seasonal, this works very well for us. Um, it's also able to handle outliers and missing data very well. And then finally, it can detect changes in trends and adjust the forecast accordingly. So we jokingly call the proof of concept Tamland after Brick Tamland, the kind but simple-minded uh, weatherman from the Anchorman movies, played by the actor Steve Carroll. And it started off as a proof of concept, but the name Tamland is sort of stuck, so it's still called Tamland. Um, we selected the Python version of the Profit Library because we have more expertise in the team in Python than we do in R. So Profit is well suited to, to, for use with Jupyter Notebooks. But we wanted to automate the process of generating these reports. So we used a, a Python library called Jupyter Book, which is designed to generate static websites from Jupyter Notebooks or from Markdown documents. The utilization data is combined with other metadata that we have, such as service catalog data and resource metadata to augment the forecasts with some useful, useful context and descriptions. In a GitLab CI pipeline, we import the utilization data from Thanos, run the forecast, and generate a static site. And then we publish this for internal use uh, using GitLab pages. And we run this pipeline at present on a weekly basis, but we're considering switching it over to a daily basis at the moment. So the question is, does this work for us? Um, and the answer is, is very much so. It's, it's been working really, really well. So this is an example of, of what the report looks like. It's a fairly standard static website hosted, as I said, on GitLab pages. On the, le oops. <laughs> on the left menu, we have uh, links to the various services running on GitLab.com. 
and then clicking through to those services, we're presented with the capacity planning forecast for each monitored uh, resource within the service. So zooming in a little further, this is an example of, of a resource within the report. In this case, it's CPU on the primary instance of one of our Redis clusters. I mentioned this previously. Uh, this, because of its single core uh, constraints, Redis CPU is one of the services that we monitor very closely through, through Tamland. Uh, at the top, we have a title and description of the resource. Um, and then we found that having that description in, in the report helps make it more accessible to a wider audience. So it can help people understand why a particular resource is important and, and uh, within the system. So the next uh, set of links that we have down, um, these links over here, are deep links down to some Grafana dashboards. And this allows an operator to quickly navigate from the report into Grafana data so they can continue investigating and understand what's going on with this particular resource. Uh, after that, we present some dates about when the resource is predicted to violate its alert threshold and also the 100% threshold. For this resource, you can see that the forecast is predicting with about 80% confidence that the resource will hit its threshold uh, around about the end of the year. And then we use this data for forecasting, well, for prioritization and for alerting. Finally, we have the most important uh, components of this chart, and that is the, the, the forecast chart itself. And this is a time series, and it's plotted over a 270-day period. So we use six months from the past and three months uh, into the future. And because of that, you'll see the current date is always two-thirds the way across the, the chart. Um, we, on the forecast, we have a median confidence interval, and then we also have a, uh, an 80% or median confidence line and an 80% confidence interval, which you can't really see that well on this chart, but there's just sort of a faint uh, line over there, which is the 80% confidence uh, band. And depending on the variance in the data, this is either larger or, or smaller, depending on how well it can predict uh, what's going on with this series. So here's an example of what Profit calls a change point. So a change point is an inflection when the growth trend and the underlying growth trend changes. And in this case, you can see a fairly sudden step up in resource consumption on this resource. And because we don't have that much headroom on this service, and the lead time to mitigating traffic off this cluster is long, the decision was made to investigate what had led to this change. And a regression was found in the application and, and corrected. And so we potentially avoided a saturation issue down the line with this report. So to give you a little bit more of a feeling of how these forecasts play out over time, what I did here was I generated a report for uh, about six months, six consecutive months, one day at a time. And what it allows you to do is sort of see an animation of what the report gives you as it plays out over time. And so for this data, we used the primary CPU from our main Postgres cluster. And you can see the forecast trending up towards capacity. And then as the, project, the decomposition project sort of completes, it sort of tends back down and then tends very low until it finds like a new, new equilibrium. And what we found is that one of the issues that we have with the forecast model at the moment is that if saturation goes from very high to very low, the model isn't very good at sort of realizing that that's a step change. And so it will continue to sort of forecast continued downward growth until the point at which it's zero or even negative. You can see just after the, uh, it goes down there to negative value, which doesn't really make a lot of sense. But the thing is that because we've seen a decrease in utilization, and uh, you know, that's not going to have a, a negative impact on the system. It's pretty safe for us just to ignore those values until we find a new equilibrium. And so we just ignore them for the moment. And then I really enjoyed making these animations, so I did another one. Um, and this shows a memory leak that we discovered in our Gitly service. Um, and it just sort of shows how Profit was able to draw our attention to, to this issue. So what you can see here is sort of the service is, is continue along like fairly normally, and then something changes, maybe a bug was introduced into the application, and it spikes up, and we would have got the, the warning of, of the uh, predicted saturation. And actually, in this case, you can see it, it, it sort of got steep, and then it went almost completely vertical at once. But we did get a little bit of an early warning, which could help with, with, um, 
you know, solving this problem before it led to, a, to an incident. And so I think this helps illustrate how Profit can be really useful for anomaly detection and for memory leaks and even security or abuse issues that you might be experiencing in your application. So earlier, I discussed how we have multiple seasonal effects that get compounded together. And this chart shows how Profit breaks the time series down into the different constituent components of, of that seasonality. And so once again, I've used the main Postgres uh, instance's primary CPU uh, from, the, from the period before the decomposition till, till after the decomposition. Um, and so from top to bottom, up here, you can see this long-term growth trend. It's growing up, and then the decomposition kicks in in July. It trends down before it sort of starts trending back up again. Um, the second, uh, this one over here, is, is holiday data. So in our case, uh, this isn't particularly important because, as I said, on holidays, we just see uh, generally traffic being lower. But if you work in an in a airline or a retailer, you might see spikes in traffic during a holiday, and this component might be really important for you. Um, the next one down is the weekly component. And so this shows how the relative effects of each day of the week. You can see on Sunday, it's very low. On Monday, it sort of starts growing. And then we have this midday, midweek peak before it, it settles back down to, to low volumes over the weekend or low resource utilization, in this case, over the weekend. And at the bottom, you can see this is a daily seasonality component. So we see very low utilization. Uh, this is all in UTC. So between uh, midnight and then sort of 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock. And then it starts climbing up here. And then we have a peak for EMEA um, uh, midday. Or actually, it's a bit below that. But, and then another peak in the afternoon when America's comes online before it goes back down again. Um, and so this is kind of the, the, the underlying data that Profit is using to, to perform the predictions. So here's some figures from our current deployment of Tamland. We monitor about 400 different service resource combinations, but this is growing all the time. So in the last month, we've added about 40 different service resource combinations into Tamland. Um, as a prerequisite for all of our production deployments, our production readiness process requires that short-term monitoring be in place before a service gets rolled into production. And because Tamland relies on the same recording rules that we use for short-term utilization metrics, all new services are automatically included in the Tamland report. The Tamland report runs for about 90 minutes on a dedicated N1 standard 8 runner, uh, but we rely on a great deal of caching in order to speed that up to fetch it for fetching historical data from Thanos. And then finally, Tamland has become a key input into our weekly engineering planning process. So any critical issues that we spot, we can get prioritized um, very quickly. So I hope you found this interesting, but what can you do with this information? So the first thing is, if you're not already doing it, I'd highly recommend that you start retaining your metrics over, the long -term, over a long-term period. For example, months, or better yet, uh, years. And there's a plethora of, of really good tools that can help with this. Obviously, I mentioned that we're using Thanos, but there are many others. Cortex, Mimir, Timescale DB are just to name a few. Um, now, you might not need this long-term metric data yet, but at some point, you probably will. And at the time you need it, if you don't have the historical data, you're going to have to start collecting it at that time. And then you might need to wait several months before you have enough data to answer the questions that you need to answer. So my next call to action is to start experimenting and connecting the Python data uh, analytics ecosystem with your Prometheus data. So there's a very simple library called Prometheus Pandas, uh, and it can load Prometheus time series data into Pandas data frames. And once you've loaded it, there's lots of fantastic tools that you can use to analyze your data. Now, obviously, in this talk, we focused on Meta's Profit Library, but there's other excellent forecasting libraries for Python out there, too, including Neural Profit, which focuses on PyTorch machine learning algorithms, uh, and GreyKite, which is a forecasting library from LinkedIn. And finally, if you're interested in trying out Tamland for your own metrics, the project is open source and available on gitlab.com. It's not only possible to use it for capacity planning, but you could use it for other purposes. For example, cloud cost forecasting, security and abuse monitoring, network monitoring. Really, the list is, is kind of endless. So I think that's it. But uh, I don't know if we've got time for, for questions.
Oh. Oh, yeah. yeah, I think we have time for like two questions or so. Hi, thank you. Um, first question is, do you store this data in a TSDB um, outside of the report? And second question is, can you have automatic alerting on the forecast, or is it a human reading so, the report? So the, the first question, we store the data in, in Thanos. So ultimately, it, it gets put into blocks and into, into object storage, and we fetch it from there. Um, our Thanos cluster, it, it, you know, because we use a lot of data in the report, and so one of the things that we've done is that Pandas has got a way of persisting data in Parquet format, and so we just cache those, those Pandas data frames in Parquet alongside the data, basically, I think, on an hour-by-hour -hour basis, and that's, that speeds up the, the, the report a, a lot. And the second question was... Oh yes, so we do. So, so for automatic alerting, what the what we do is I mentioned that we have that uh, date, uh, that that date over there. Um, so when we see something basically have a, a forecasted date like that, uh, we get the job to talk to Prometheus Push Gateway, and so I think we have a metric which is like time land days to saturation or something like that. And that's, that's how we sort of kick off the process of, of alerting on it. So at the moment, it's kind of a bit noisy. And we are thinking of actually just opening issues in GitLab directly. There's some reasons why that's an advantage. But yeah, cool. Any others? Oh, one more. As far as I understood, and this is really great, uh, seeing this story live, uh, or at least in public, because uh, this gives more strength to keep the metrics and keep the history, the history of what our applications do. Um, you're tracking existing applications, existing infrastructure. Yeah. Um, can you feed it with data when you introduce a new product line that you just have benchmarked or run on stage with synthetic load or something like that and see? how much you need to grow to support a new product, let's say GitLab yeah. so, X, something like that. So the way that we do that at the moment isn't the most scientific way. It's kind of, all we'll do is we won't generate reports on anything that has less than, I think it's 30 days of data. So when a new resource comes into the system, we've got, we'll collect data for 30 days before we start doing anything. And even in that case, often 30 days of data, it isn't very good. There's some, I think on this previous slide, yeah, there, that, you can see there, that's 30 days of data. It's, uh, sorry, it'll come back down in a second. It's, it's not a very good forecast, but what we sort of rely on is that a lot of uh, our services are kind of uh, soft launched, and so we'll see kind of like low traffic utilization and that will happen in that first 30-day period, and then we'll just use that data kind of going forward. So we don't sort of feed, back feed it with, any, with anything else. I don't know if that answers your question. Cool. Cool. All right. Let's thank give you. another round of applause. And thank you very much. Thank you.